Amen. You may be seated this morning. How good and how beautiful is it to be serving the Lord in these last days. I do appreciate Him so very much. Uh, today, typically, I would preach the Christmas message uh, the Sunday before we have Christmas. But since, uh, you know, uh, usually the Christmas program is a week later than it is, but we've kind of shifted things around this year. And so I'm going to continue on in the series of messages that I began a couple of weeks ago. Uh, if you were here last Sunday, we had a, a wonderful time, a wonderful graduation of several students graduating and uh, finishing a course in discipleship, and we've got another group getting ready to go forward. And uh, we are getting ready and anticipating a great move of God and doing some wonderful things uh, in our country, in the world, and uh, just in our community and in this local body. We believe that God is going to do some tremendous things. And so this morning, I want to ask you a question before I preach. How many of you still believe in miracles? See the hands of those that believe in miracles. Well, that's good. 100% of you believe in miracles. And I believe that God still performs miracles. But I also believe that God still waits on us. Amen? There's, if you read the Bible, in Exodus, there's two beautiful pictures of prayer. And one of them says this. When they gathered together, God would not be in their midst because of their obstinate. And then in the other verse, in Exodus 34, it said that when Moses went on the mountain the second time to get the Ten Commandments, I guess there had been a lot of repentance going on, a lot of getting things right. The people had sanctified themselves. The people had cleansed themselves. And when he went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, the Bible said as he knelt to seek God, God descended and stood beside him. Isn't that a beautiful picture of prayer that God left the throne of heaven in the form of his presence and came and stood beside Moses as he prayed? Don't you want God to, to stand beside you when you pray? Uh, I challenge you today, when you read the scripture, take commentary. Begin to make a commentary. You know, we have commentaries and we all go to commentaries to get research. Build your own commentary. What is God saying to you in that verse of scripture? Let him speak to you as you read through the Word of God. And, and I have found that if I just write commentary on every verse or every chapter that I read, uh, I can go back to that later and glean such wonderful insight in what God is trying to tell us. Now, so today I'm going to speak on fasting again as we're in that series. And the reason that I'm doing that is, is our local church is getting ready for a 21-day fast in January. Now, fasting is a discipline in the church that has lost favor because we all want to be comfortable. And I promise you, when you fast, you're not going to be comfortable. You're not going to be comfortable. It's not designed to make you comfortable, I don't think. Yet, when it is practiced in the church, it has brought tremendous results. The word discipline is defined as a practice of training that produces certain results. We should practice discipline throughout. That's why when you read scripture, you find so many different types of fast, so many different lengths of fast, and all the stuff that goes on. In scripture, every fast that anybody ever did in scripture was rewarded. Did you know that? Every fast in the Bible was rewarded by God, whether it was one day or 40 days, 21 days, 14 days, or 7 days. Every last one of them, God rewarded. So what I'm saying to you today is when we get ready for this fast, and I'm asking you and preparing you, and um, going, you know, I've given you all the different types of fast, and you'll get an open letter from me right prior to the fast beginning explaining all of that. But as you get ready for this, I challenge you now to begin to write down some things that you personally are going to ask God for. What do you need God to do as you fast? Number two, I ask that you begin to prepare your heart for fasting. If you fast and you're upset or angry with someone, unforgiving to someone, and all your, your life is just disarray, 
then you're going to go on a 21-day diet. It's going to receive about the same reward. Fasting must be done in accordance with Scripture. Our lives need to be lived in accordance with the Scripture. We need to live out our lives the way Jesus lived out His life. He forgave. He loved. He cared. He didn't show partiality. He loved everybody the same. He rebuked. He reproved. And He embraced. He pushed away. And He told people what was right and what was wrong. He stood. He had a, he had a baseline to stand on. He had a, he had a negotiable and a non-negotiable. We find that the Pharisees would not negotiate on anybody found in any kind of sin. But God negotiated or Christ negotiated with them and said, I got a better point of view. Let's give them a second chance. A group of ministers wanted to stone a lady that they called in the act of adultery. She would have been dead and gone and they'd have been happy. But Jesus said, why don't we give the woman an opportunity to change her life and to become a new creature and to do things differently? And when we live our lives from that perspective, how wonderful, how beautiful, how much like Christ we become. Our view of Christ sometimes is a little bit distorted. Sometimes we view him as just very angry with us with a big stick. I don't see that picture in Scripture. I mean, the very first thing that's mentioned about him in the New Testament, for God so loved the world, that doesn't sound like a God that wants me to die right away. Now, God has a, has a standard that he calls us to live. It's called the standard of holiness. So as you prepare to fast, you might begin to ask God about some things that are in your life that you need broken out. Maybe you're dealing with unforgiveness or you're dealing with an inability to take care of your debts. You're struggling with the, the principle of tithing and giving and all of those issues. You need to talk to God about that and help Him to get, get that settled with you. January the 5th through the 25th is a fast called by the, our church worldwide. When we begin our fast, we will be joining with over 2 million members. 2 million Christians in over 130 countries around the world. Now that is powerful. And that will produce results. We've been doing this in this local church for several years. And I believe that God wants us and wants his body to have some great results. I believe that God wants to restore everything to the church that we are missing. I'd like to see divine healing come back. Like it ought to be. Oh, you know, we see divine healing here and there. But I like to see everybody that's sick get healed. Everybody that's demon-possessed or are dealing with an addiction to be set free. All of those issues. But, and God can still do those things in the 21st century. So, but I want to begin today with the three very basic Christian duties. Now, there are more than three, but these three I want you to get down. They are found in the book of Matthew, the sixth chapter. Matthew 6, 1 says, when you give. Not if, when. When you give your charitable gifts. The scripture mandates that we are to be a giving people. Everything that God controls gives. Matthew 6, 5 <coughs> says, when you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Now, do you understand the power of that verse of Scripture there? Don't be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue, in the church house, and on the street corners, that they may be seen of men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Listen, if you pray with all of the junk going on in your life, the bitterness and the unforgiveness and the lack of love and the resentment and the jealousies and the envies and all of this trash that we allow to get in our lives, if you pray with all of that, then you're praying like a hypocrite. And we're challenged not to pray that way. And then in Matthew 6, 16, when you fast, not if you fast, when you fast. When you fast, do not be like a hypocrite with that either. Don't go around telling everybody you meet, you know, I'm fasting today. I'm so spiritual, I'm fasting. When you fast, there's an Old Testament scripture that tells you to get up and anoint your head. Wash your face and anoint your head. That means get up in the morning, wash your face and comb your hair and go about your day. 
Don't struggle with all that other stuff. So the Scripture mandates that we give, that we pray, and that we fast. Fasting should be a discipline. By discipline, I mean there's something that we practice on a regular basis. Not something that we just do occasionally. Why? Because fasting is a secret that unlocks heaven's door and it slams shut the gates of hell. When you begin to fast and when you begin to pray and to call upon the name of the Lord, something very powerful happens. It begins to open the windows of heaven and it begins to close the gates of hell that the Bible says that are against us that cannot prevail. Why do you think the scripture says they can't prevail? Because God left a mandate in his church to pray, to give, and to fast. And when you do that the gates of hell are shut and they cannot prevail against you my friend it is time for us as a church to begin to open the windows of heaven and close the devil's gates you'll have less difficulty in your life when you fast and pray You'll have an ability to stand strong you'll have an ability and an authority that you can tell the adversary I rebuke you <coughs> And he has to go. Now, you know, in Scripture, not everybody that says, I rebuke you, gets results. You remember the sons of Siva? Seven of them went out to rebuke a demon, and what happened to them? The Bible says that that spirit jumped on those guys and tore their clothes off, and they ran home naked. Now, I don't want to do that to you. And so we've read that, so we're scared to death. I mean, what we want to do with a mentally or a, a demon-possessed person is put them in a mental institution and say something's wrong with them. There is something wrong, and it is the church's responsibility to get a hold of God and to loose that person from prison and set them free. We're afraid to do that. I had a guy tell me, a well-meaning church member, <clears throat> had been a member of the church for 40-some years. He said, you know, Pastor... If you keep talking like that, you're going to make the devil mad. I said, sir, when I knelt the very first time and said, forgive me of my sins, I made him mad. I don't think he's got any better humor with me since. What do you, you made him mad? He was mad when Jesus left the throne room. He was mad when he, Jesus was put on the cross. He was mad when he put him in a tomb. But he was madder when he came out of the tomb. And he gave victory and power to the church over all the power of the enemy. He's not going to get any better sorts with us. But you and I can allow him to have a free run in our life. I don't want him to have that. Today, I want to speak to you about crucifying our flesh or maybe overcoming our stomach. Our stomachs get us in a lot of trouble. You know, everybody's trying to make their stomach flat. They're doing, they're buying all kinds of stuff to make it flat and do all those other kinds of things. Our stomach causes us great difficulty. We worry about it. We talk about it. We look at it in the mirror and say, man, I wish I didn't have it. You can go ahead and laugh because you know you do that. Every last one of you in here. You stand like this, all of you, all the time, looking and seeing. We are used to eating three meals a day. When you fast, you must do just that. Overcome your will of your stomach. Because your stomach will rumble and grumble and complain and argue with you and say that you are dying. You are not dying. It only feels like you're dying for three days. After that, it gets better. Somebody said, I can't fast for three days. I would die. No, you wouldn't. If you read the book of Exodus, you will find that Moses fasted 40 days, 40 nights, no water, no food. Don't try that. He was in the presence of God. The Bible said also said when he came off the mountain, his face was so shining, so bright that he had to put a veil on it. The people couldn't even look at him. Because he was in the presence of God and he didn't need any of that stuff. But you, you need some substance while you're fasting. You need some water. We are used to three meals a day. And when your stomach doesn't get that, it complains. And you know, medical science says you ought to eat about five times a day. Some of you have been really doing that. You know, science says I'm to eat five times a day. I don't want to disappoint science. So, I say, you know, I have breakfast, and then I, I have a snack, and then I have, then I have another snack, and then I, have, then I have another snack, and a snack, and another snack, and another snack before I go to bed, you know, because I got I to gotta keep 
keep up with science. So we're used to that, and our stomach is used to that. And when you withdraw that from, the ad, from your stomach, your, your stomach gets mad at you. And it starts making noise and complaining and hurting and cramping and carrying on. And you just think, oh, you know, I better eat. I, I might get sick. You won't get sick. None of that stuff's going to happen to you. It's been said that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Most women know that. And so does the devil. So does the devil. The whole human race fell under, under the rule of the stomach. In the very beginning, in the garden, it was the stomach that caused there to be difficulties in our life. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. Now, you guys help me preach this enjoy this. You know, there's, God's got such a great sense of humor. And I love the way the Bible is put together. It tells such beautiful stories. Let's look at this. The Lord planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put a man whom he formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now let's look in the same chapter at verse 16 and 17. Simple instructions. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but <clears throat> of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. Somebody asked me one time, Well, why did God put that tree there? I said, You know, I can't answer that for you, but I, was, I would think he might have been hoping that man he'd created and breathed into would love him a little more than he loved an apple or whatever that was. I don't think it was an apple, but whatever that fruit was, you would think that. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. Now, that sounds pretty simple. But the devil convinced Eve that she should eat from that forbidden tree. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Let's look at that. And she did, and she gave some to her husband. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes. You know, that's what you do to yourself. You know, when you're fasting, don't go down to the deli and stand there and drool over the, the meat case. You know, don't walk up to the deli and look at all of that stuff that's in there and stand there and drool and say, you know, I just want to smell it. It just makes it worse. Don't do that. Don't walk through the cookie aisle and look at every cookie and go over to the donut place and look at all the donuts. You're killing yourself. You need to stay away from those places. But we'll do that. She saw that it was good. Food is pleasant. I mean, it's supposed to be the very first thing he created. It was good to look at. So when you go to the deli, they make it look good. Stay away from the deli. And it was desirable to make one wise. And she took fruit and she ate. And she gave it to her husband and he ate. And then they, the lie began. I mean, he began to blame. She began to blame the serpent. And he began to blame her. And, you know, everybody blamed somebody. And that's how we are. You know, I, I didn't really plan to eat it. It just snuck up on me. I was really fasting, but I was in there, and I just got so hungry. You know, I thought, and the enemy came to us and talked to us and said, you know, it won't hurt just to eat a little bit. And then you ate, and you felt like you broke the fast, and you're over there hiding, trying to sow fig leaves. No, you weren't doing that, really. You weren't trying to sow fig leaves around you, but you were hiding. You know, you felt condemned before God. Don't do it. If you, if you fall off the wagon, just get back on it and keep riding. And with that one meal, Adam and Eve immediately went from a life of peacefully enjoying God's presence to a fearful place of hiding from the presence among the trees in the garden. And when we feel like we failed God, sometimes we go in that same place. We go hide somewhere. But what we need to do is embrace God and say, God, I blew it. Start over tomorrow or start over the next hour with your fast. Continue on. If you are fasting and you get 10 days in and you, you eat something, don't say, well, I can't fast anymore. I'll just quit. Get back up and try it again. They literally ate themselves out of house and home. They ate themselves out of the will of God for their lives. They ate themselves out of God's provision and plan for their lives. And the list goes on, but their stomachs were temporarily satisfied, and we still suffer from the consequences of their appetites today. We're still dealing with that. Fasting is met with resistance. We don't even teach on it too much anymore. Because it makes people uncomfortable. There are two things that we don't preach much in church. Fasting and stewardship. 
We don't, we don't preach about tithing and giving too often. We don't preach about fasting. In this church, we do. But in a lot of places, I've been told, oh, you know, we don't even talk about that fasting. It, may, it, it offends people. It makes them upset. I said, it's the Word of God. How can, how can the Word of God offend anybody? Oh, wait a minute. The Bible said it would offend them. So go ahead and let them be offended. It's all right to get offended once in a while. That, that helps you get corrected. We, we must be uncomfortable at times. This is a part of the plight we suffer in the church today is we don't. Lack of power. Power comes from heaven and only. It is not brought down by our fame or our facilities or our prestige or our prompt. Fasting is brought, power is brought down from heaven through prayer and fasting. I am not, I am talking about a power that rescues the perishing, casts out the demon, pulls down the stronghold, sets the captives free, and liberates men and gives them wholeness in their lives and in their, in their bodies. We need that kind of power back in the church, and we're not gonna get it by singing songs and clapping our hands. We're gonna get it when we lay on our face before the presence of God and call upon His name. When we push away from the table, when we say, God, I will lay aside and fast and pray. And when we do that, God answers us. When Esther and the Jewish people were in such peril, their whole nation was in in peril of being annihilated. They were making plans to hang some of them. They had went as far as to build the gallows. Rainier, they had built a gallows to hang Mordecai on. They were getting ready to hang the guy. They called a fast. You know, it wouldn't hurt this whole nation to call a fast. A lot of us don't like what we see happening. And it's a good coffee and tea conversation. But I tell you where it would be a better conversation. If we would begin to push back the tea and the coffee and the crumpets and the cupcakes and the scones. We would begin to get out of the Starbucks and turn off the TV and run over here in this corner and hide away with God. If we begin to unplug our, our, our texting and our, that thing that we can't get away from. You know, I think sometimes a cell phone was a great invention and a, and a horrible invention. Who, where was I? Oh, one of the guys that works for me, me and him were, were working in a building downtown in Portland, Oregon, and we were standing in the hallway waiting on the elevator, and a lady walked into us. She had her phone and she was walking like this. And, and me and him are standing there we're, and we're looking at each other saying, let's see if she runs into us or goes around us. And she goes, <laughs> scared the life out of her. We'd been standing there the whole time. She walked down the whole, highway, the whole hallway and there we were and she, and she didn't even know we were in the hallway. But it would be good if we would unplug and step away from things for a little while. You know, it's okay to put yourself, to turn the thing off and to put it in a drawer when you're fasting and praying and calling upon the name of the Lord. I don't know how we get a voice or get a word from God because we get so many other words and so many other voices. We need to unplug and it would do this nation wonders if we would unplug for a while and begin to pray and to call on His name and say, Oh God, will you visit us again? Church, we want God to visit us and heal bodies and deliver men and women and fix marriages and to restore them and to restore children and parents are you out of sorts with your parents get a hold of God and let God get a hold of that situation and I promise you God will change it I promise you God will I'm a living testimony of the power of God to change situations my father and I were at odds with each other we didn't speak for, for, for many years And I knew that I was the Christian. He wasn't the Christian. It was my responsibility to change things, not his. And you know what? I got sick. I didn't get sick. I had shoulder surgery. And rotator cuff surgery is not fun. Laid me up for about three weeks. It was cold and snowing. In 2008, I couldn't do a thing but sit in the house and look outside. I, got, I want this nut standing in the house. I'm a guy that's got to be moving all the time. So, I have a barn. I went out in the barn, and I'd wrap up and hobble out to the barn at night, and we had a treadmill out there, and I'd walk on that treadmill, freezing to death. But I would pray, and, begin to, and, and God began to deal with me about praying for my dad. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed for about three weeks. I prayed for him every day for a half an hour. Then on December the 22nd, I called my dad to say Merry Christmas. 
because my wife told me, you need to call your dad. Of course, she, tells, she told me that every year that we've been married, you need to call your dad, you need to call your dad. And I never would call a guy. So she told me, you need to call your dad. So I called my dad. We had our conversation, you know, how are you? It's two minutes long. When I got ready to hang up, I said, Dad, would you like to accept Christ as your personal Savior? And he said, yes. And I froze. <laughs> Took me a second. I, you know, he told me no so many times. I was expecting no, and that was going to be in the conversation. I was going to hang up and call him next year. But he said, you know, I think I would. So I led him to Christ. And do you know that my dad's going to church almost every Sunday now? He's 80 years old. He gets up and goes to church every Sunday. Had I not changed my attitude, his attitude would have never changed. Not only did his attitude change, but for my dad to go to church, that, that's, pretty, that's big. For my dad to quit drinking, that's big. For my dad to quit being the person he was, that's big. That, that is a God moment. But I'm telling you, if you want things to change, begin to do what, calls, what God calls out to change. Anytime we do something, every fast is rewarded. You may want to put down in your fast, in your book that you're writing, down that I'm going to fast about this. I'm going to fast about a relationship, my, my marriage, my relationship with my parents, my children, uh, grandparents, or whatever it might be. I'm going to fast and pray and ask God to help me in this position. I want to see the power to break the stronghold. What stronghold has the enemy set up in your life that needs to be pulled down? Let me tell you, church, you can go to God in prayer and fasting. And the Bible says we have the power to pull down strongholds. But that power comes at a price. Jesus showed us that price before he ever began his open public ministry. The Bible says he went out into the wilderness and he fasted. And when he was fasting, he had every temptation. Temptation of fame. Temptation of food. Temptation to exercise the authority that he had. And on and on the list goes. And the Bible said he refused every one of those. And he came out of that wilderness full of the power and the presence of God. We cannot walk off and leave bad relationships behind us. We just can't walk off and say, you know what, I'm just, I moved on. That's America's theme today. I moved on. Really? I've moved on? How's that working out for you? We don't move on. I deal with people that's in their 50s and 60s that have moved on, that are still dealing with childhood offenses in their lives. Moving on doesn't work. Forgiveness works. Pulling down strongholds works. Listen, I'm not condemning anybody in this room. What I'm simply saying is I'm trying to give you the information. You, you, it's in your heart. You want to change and you want to know how to change. This is how to change. If you have an addiction, did you know that you can fast and break addictions in your life? The Bible talks about that. If I had time to preach all of that to you today, I could preach you seven sermons or eight sermons on fasting and take you through and show you in Scripture all of these things that fasting can do. It can absolutely break addictions in your life, strongholds that the enemy has set up in your life and you think you'll have to deal with forever. Let me tell you what, you don't have to deal with that. You don't have to deal with any of those addictions in your life for the rest of your life. God can deliver you. Get hungry to know him in the power of his resurrection and also in the fellowship of his suffering. And that may mean when you're fasting, you suffer just a little bit. Another example of the reign of the stomach and the lives of the, is the people of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, when we read and when we preach about that, we usually focus on one thing, rampant homosexuality. Is that true? When we talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, they, you know, they, we talk about the guys that went there and they, they got blinded. They were groping at the door and said, we want to have those men sexually send them out to us. And we preach about that and we wax eloquent all about that. But there was another sin that God was angry with in that city. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49 and 50. Let's look at that. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, Sodom and Gomorrah, had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor, 
They didn't give. They didn't fast. Do you see that? They weren't practicing good scripture. They didn't take care of the poor. They were haughty. They were full of food. They didn't fast. They didn't give. And they didn't pray. And God was displeased with them and destroyed the entire city. Both of them. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Now, therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. <laughs> I told you earlier when I began the sermon, there was a scripture in Exodus that talks about when the people of Israel, you know, God's presence was with them. And in one place he said, my presence wasn't, wouldn't even be with you because you were obstinate. You know what obstinate means? Bullheaded, hard-headed. You wouldn't listen. Prideful. And God said, my presence was not with them. Right there. His presence was not with them. I took them away and I destroyed them as I saw fit. In other words, I just got rid of the whole bunch. I don't want that to happen to me, do you? I'm not saying that it's going to. They didn't give. They didn't take care of the need of the poor. They did not pray because they were full of pride and idleness. And they were guilty of the sin of gluttony. Gluttony. Full. full. Look at Esau. His stomach was truly the king in his life. Genesis chapter 25, verse 34. If you fast, you're going to have to overcome your stomach. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew and lentils. Then he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now I want to talk about that for just a moment. <clears throat> the birthright of the firstborn brought his father special blessings and privileges. It automatically ensured that Esau would receive a double portion of all his father's estate. This was a blessing from God and not, was not to be taken lightly. God had a plan and a destiny for Esau's life, but his lust for food and instant gratification was more important. Let me ask you this morning, do you know God's plan for your life? We talk about I'm called to preach. Let me tell you, before I ever preached my first sermon, I spent many, many days fasting and praying and seeking God because back when I was getting licensed, brother, you didn't walk up and say, bless God, bless God, bless God, and they give you license. You earned it through what you lived and how you lived and how you preached. You had to earn it. It wasn't free gratis. You had to go to school. You had to get, you had to get some type of sort of, of a degree of some sort. You had to learn and you had to apply yourself and you had to go serve with a senior pastor for two years as a MIT, a minister in training. You had to take every course that was offered. You had to be in church every time on time. You were expected at a moment's notice to go in the pastor's office or the overseer's office and conduct a business meeting or give him, tell him how to perform a wedding or do a communion service. I was called up out of an audience in a convention full of people, several hundred people, and told, recite the church's covenant right now. Overseer, call me up out there and said, you, come here. You're studying to be a preacher. Recite the covenant. That's why when I take members in the church, I don't have to get a piece of paper and hold, well, you sincerely promise in the present. That's so ingrained in me because you didn't get licensed until you could do that. You had to apply yourself. And it took fasting and praying and diligence. God has a plan for your life, but sometimes we allow God's plan for our life to never be bring to fruition because we don't know our birthright. We must begin to call on the name of the Lord and to pray and to fast and find our destiny. And when we find that destiny, we have to hold on to that destiny through prayer and fasting. There are people in this congregation that have the discipline of fasting every week, and I'm one of them. I never stand in a pulpit that I don't fast. I would never think of doing such a thing. That is what, that's my training. That's my upbringing. That's what God spoke into my heart. So I just, I won't do that. I don't say that to brag. There are several people in here that do the same thing. Before they teach their classes and preach their sermons and direct whatever they're doing, they, they pray and fast that week. 
That's a discipline of their life. They try to do it every week, every week, every week, every week. I have my day and my day, I just, I just do my day. That's, that's a discipline that I have that I give to the Lord. That's His day and it belongs to Him. Because I know I need, a, I need to, something to preach on Sunday, so I fast and pray and say, God, what do you want? Not what do I want. Listen, I can get a sermon out of anything. I read the Bible every day. I can, just sermons just are everywhere in the Bible. I don't know if you know that. They're everywhere. They're just growing up out of the things. I mean, every page, you just turn it in. They're just growing off of the page. It's not a lack of sermons in Scripture. But not every sermon is right for that day. You've got to try to find the mind of God and get that sermon for that day. The writer of Hebrew gives us a strong warning against becoming like Esau. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 through 17. Looking carefully, lest any one of you fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up in you cause you trouble, and many become defiled, lest there be a fornicator, profane person like Esau. All a guy did was sell his birthright for a bowl of beans. God calls him a profane person. Calls him profane because he allowed his stomach to be in charge of his destiny. He was the firstborn of that family. And as the firstborn of that family, he had a covenantal right to a double portion anointing. But because he'd been out in the woods hunting, he was hungry. And he goes in, and his brother is cooking beans and stew. Man, got to have me some of them red beans and rice. Give me a piece of that bread while you at it. The Bible said he ate that and got up and went on his way. Then when he went back to dad and said, hey, dad, where's my blessing? He said, I don't have one for you. I don't have one for you. Esau, Jacob said, give me your birthright. You know, and then he goes in and we say, well, Jacob deceived his dad. He'd already asked permission from Esau. He said, Esau, can I? Have your birthright for this bowl of beans. He said, you can have my birthright. So now he had to trick dad. So that was the, the skin on that and the, all the lamb and the stew. That was the trick on dad because dad was blind and old and couldn't see. But Esau had already agreed to give it up. Esau had agreed to give up his birthright already. So what Jacob did, we just really rail on Jacob. But Jacob had already told him, will you give me your birthright for this bowl of beans? He said, you can have it. What good's a birthright if I die? I mean, if I don't eat this bowl of beans right now, I'm going to die. If you don't have that apple fritter right now, you go, no. If I don't have that deli sandwich right now, I'm going to die. Maybe not. Oh, my, I need to hurry. How long shall I fast is often the question that I'm asked. The duration of the fast can vary. There are significant numbers in the Bible. I'm just going to give you a few of them that we find when we read the Scripture. Three days, seven days, 21 days, 40 days. But there's also references to half days and 24-hour fast in Scripture. I just think you need to make it a weekly discipline because God rewards all that you do. There's not a real formula. The length of time you choose should depend on the circumstances. It should depend on what you're asking God to do. Esther fasted three days, absolute fast, no food, no water, because of the plight that her family was in. Don't get bogged down by this. Just begin somewhere. If, you don't, if you've never fasted, begin with a half a day. Begin this 21-day fast and say, I'm going to fast till noon every day for 21 days. Moses fasted 40 days when he received the Ten Commandments in Exodus 34, 27 through 28. Esther called, her Jew, uh, called the Jews to a three-day fast. And you can read this beautiful Beautiful scenario, and I challenge you to read the book of Esther, chapter 4, 5, 6, and 7. It is a beautiful, beautiful story of love. It, just, it has such, so much stuff in it. You just should read that. Hannah, who was childless and had greatly distressed over it, wept and did not eat, 1 Samuel 1, 17. The Bible records many different circumstances and types and lengths of fast. Joshua, for instance, fasted 40 days. Daniel did a 21-day fast of just partial fast no no desserts paul was on at least two fasts. probably he fasted many more but there's reference to him being on a three-day fast and a 14-day fast 
Peter fasted three days and Jesus fasted for 40 days. So it just depends on where you're at, how you should fast. The types of fast located in Scripture are found in Scripture. Here's the three that you find in Scripture. The absolute fast. The duration of that is about three days where you have no food and no water. Absolutely none. The normal fast, that's what Jesus did. No food but water. He had water. Because the Bible said after, after the fast, he was hungry, but he wasn't thirsty. Thirst pangs are much stronger than hunger pangs. Then there's a partial fast. That's what Daniel did. He fasted 21 days, and because of the work he was involved in, carrying on heads of state, he had no pleasant bread. He had no desserts. So you might want to say when you're doing your 21-day fast, okay, Lord, I'm not going to just, just talk to the Lord about what he wants you to do. And he may tell you, no sweets. And so for 21 days, you don't eat any sweets. I know some of you passing out right now. Whew, don't call 911, just phantom. No sweets for 21 days. No meat for 21 days. Well, I don't know what God's going to speak to you, but you let him speak to you about that. Here's some tips I want to give you for fasting. Drink plenty of water. Water is like a flushing agent. It'll flush toxins out of your body because when you fast, your body's going to begin to go through your, your body and it'll begin to burn up everything in your body that's not good. Damaged tissue. Your body is very smart. It'll begin to go through your body and it'll begin to just clean house. It'll go in every corner before it touches one good, strong muscle. It'll, it'll eat everything in your body that's of no value. Scar tissue. All of that stuff, it begins to eat diseases. Everything in your body just begins to devour that stuff. And, it, and those toxins will begin to come out of you, and you'll get headaches. And that's what that headache's about. That's toxins leaving your body. There's a good book you can read. It's, uh, it's called Toxic Relief by Dr. Don Colbert. He's done a lot of research and studied the body's needs to rid itself of toxins. Uh, toxins that cause illness and disease and fatigue and many other ailments that we deal with. Fasting will, can actually help you do, get rid of all that stuff. You might get a headache when you fast. That's a sign that you needed to fast. Headaches are a result of the body burning impurities. You ever set a piece of rubber on fire and watched it smoke and stink and everybody run? That's what your body's doing. It's burning that gross stuff in you. And it, it comes out as headaches, foul taste in your mouth. Tongue feels like it's thick. All kinds of things happen when you fast. Don't let any of it scare you. You're not going to die. Don't call the doctor. Don't go to the doctor. Drink some water. You may feel sluggish and tired. You may, you may have an irritability. You may not be able to sleep. And oh yes, did I mention you will be hungry? You will be hungry when you fast for at least the first three days. After that, it's not so bad. When you fast, you need to pray, pray, and pray. You need to pray when you fast. Read the Word of God. Spend some time alone with God. Lay your cell phone down. Turn off the TV. Turn off the computer. And just go out somewhere and spend some time listening to God. I have a place prepared that I pray that has no technology at all. It, ha it don't even have heat. I, I wish it had that technology, oh. January is not comfortable. I did buy me a heater and put it out there. But it's a good place to go. It has no phone, no TV. It has a restroom, and that's it. And a sink, so I can get a drink of water. I usually take bottled water. That's all that's there. I don't need anything else when I'm out there. I don't need to hear from any of you when I'm, I'm, when I'm out praying and fasting. In fact, I don't want to hear from you. You know, that's what I have voicemail for. And you know this crazy thing called email and text? I can look on my phone and, get, and, and see the text that you sent me yesterday and last week. So I don't have to have it instantly. As soon as my phone goes ding, I don't have to grab it and, and turn over everything trying to get to it. I, I can read it later. But I need to be alone with God and find, his, find his, his will for my life. Lord, I need directions on how to do things. When Rainier and I started this class, we didn't just... Say, so, hey, you know, it's a great idea. Let's start a class. We spent three years praying and fasting for this and asking God, what should it look like? Uh, you know, and, and uh, we, ne we decided not to do it until God began to give us what the, what the logo should look like and the scripture that we should base it on and, and all of those other things. 
we didn't just, that just didn't happen overnight. We just didn't wake up one morning and say, man, I got the logo down. I got this down. I got that figured out. We fasted and prayed for that for three years. Said, God, what's it going to look like? We had one thing in mind. God had another thing in mind, and he changed our mind. But he couldn't have changed our mind if we hadn't been listening and praying and fasting and asking him. We wouldn't have allowed that. We'd have just went on with our plan. There will be times when you're fasting that you will feel like your fast is not doing any good. Remember what happened to Jesus when he was fasting for 40 days? The Bible said that Satan came and talked to him while he was in his fast. Chris, can you come? The adversary is going to come when you fast and talk to you. He's going to tell you that it's not working. That it's not doing any good. And on and on the list may go. And he may tell you, you need to eat this. And the lies just began to go off. Just don't listen to it. Just don't listen to it. I found that when he does that kind of thing, just begin to do what Jesus did. He just began to quote the word of God. He just began to, to quote what God had said. It's not, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. When he was hungry, that's what he said. It's good. It is written that man shall not live by bread alone. That's what he said when he was tempted to turn stones into bread. And you know he could have done that. Satan knew that Jesus had the power to turn a stone into bread. That's why he said, turn those stones into bread. Because he knew the power that was in Christ. He knew that he could have said, rock, become bread. And it would become bread. That's why he told him to do that. He carried him up on a high pinnacle and said, cast yourself down. And then Satan began to use the word. Because it's written that God gives his angels charge concerning you. He said, well, if you're going to use the word of God, I'll use it. Because I know it also. And sometimes you'll, you'll hear those verses of Scripture and you'll say, okay, God's telling me it's okay to go eat. Well, maybe that wasn't God. Maybe that was the adversary quoting Scripture because he knows it, you know. He can quote it pretty good. Probably knows it better than some of us. He's been on the receiving end of it for several thousand years, you know. You know his origination, his beginning was the anointed cherub in heaven. Wasn't always called Lucifer, Satan. It was at one time known as Angel of Light. That's why the New Testament says that he has, the, he has the ability to transform his angels into ministers of light. Satan still has that ability. He can transform his ministers into angels of light. But God says he makes his ministers a flame of fire. Better than light. Light don't burn. Fire does. But do you know that? That's why it's important when you fast to read his word. Let his word read you. Let it go in your heart and change who you are. This morning, if you're here and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, that is the greatest need you have. That is the single greatest need that you have this morning is to know Christ as your personal Savior. Anybody here with me today, you, have, you are not born again. And you want Christ to forgive you of your sins. Would you just put your hand up? Anybody in this building with me this morning? You're not where you need to be with Christ and you want him to forgive your sins. Anybody here today? Would you stand with me this morning all over the building? Let's stand together today. <clears throat> this morning when we sang, were singing and worshiped, the second song that we did that talks about I am forgiven. Every time I sing that song, it makes me weep to think that I'm forgiven. That all my sins have been washed away. That he took all that I had done in life and he rolled it up and he removed it from my life. The Bible said he has a place for the sins that, that we commit. When we ask for forgiveness. I ain't exactly sure where it is, but I read about it. As far as the east is from the west. Don't know what that looks like. That's where my sins are. They're removed from me that far away. That means I can't even see them anymore. Or I shouldn't be looking for them. 
How wonderful it feels to be redeemed and to be forgiven. When I close my eyes at night, I know where I'm going. And that is wonderful peace. Paul, it's wonderful to know that if I don't wake up in the morning, oh, I'll see you over there, brother. I'll see you over there. Isn't that wonderful to know that? If I get in my automobile and start heading down the road and I don't make it, I'll see you over there. How wonderful and how beautiful that is to know. That is, that is just sweet peace to know that. That is sweet peace. To know that all my sins have been washed away by His blood. That He has plunged me beneath the flood. And He has cleansed me of all unrighteousness. My responsibility is to stay under the flow. Somebody said to stay on the spout where the blessings come out. That's my responsibility. To stay right there. Stay right there. This morning, if you're in this room with me, and you want to begin today talking to God about how He wants you to fast. I'm already writing in my journal what I'm going to fast about. I'm jotting down notes so that when I begin, I'll have a, a page that I can pray off of. This is what I'm fasting and praying about and asking you about, God. Haven't really decided. I may have 21 things, something for each day. I don't know yet. I'm, I'm working on it. Compiling my list. Checking it twice. You got it. You want to write things down because you want to have a direction when you're doing this. You want to have a, a, a place you're going. We would never get in the car without a destination and just sit there and where am I going today? But we'll fast and pray without an inkling of what we're, we're fasting and praying about. Write it down. Get it laid out before you. So when you go in that prayer room, you'll have something to talk to the Father about. If you want to begin that process today, and you want to join me here in the front for just a minute or two, and we can call on the name of the Lord, I invite you to come I'm from all over the building. If you want to come, just come and we'll spend some time just asking God, Lord... What do you want me to fast about? Begin to stir my heart about that. Begin to speak to me about that. Begin to minister to me about that. And as you come this morning, you, there may be those of you in here that are not born again and you want your sins forgiven. Let me tell you, Christ to forgive your sins just like that when you call on his name. If you want Christ to forgive you, let me assure you, he'll forgive sins. He'll wash them away. He'll make you a new creature you're in here today and you want to come and pray come on just come and kneel on the altar with these folks and begin to call on the name of the Lord and ask him how he wants you to fast 